Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. You just might feel a little better on the other side. Well, hello there. This is Dee, and welcome to episode 126 of the Benzo Free Podcast. How are you doing? Uh, I know for many of you, it may be a struggle, and I get that. Um, I've been struggling, too, with a bunch of different things, but that's life, and we all deal with that sometimes. I got tons to talk with you today, and um, I've scripted just a little bit, mostly just notes like, Talk about this, talk about that, but not much in detail. My intro might go a little bit long today just because i got some things I want to cover with you and things that I've had thoughts of lately I wanted to chat with you about, so I'm not going to apologize about that because <laughs> I know this is just how I do it, and so I don't know that I need to constantly say sorry if I'm doing going too long because sometimes I go long and that's just how this podcast is. Some of you enjoy that, and I'm happy that it works for some of you. But it's not going to be all me, and that is definitely the take here, because after that, the rest of the podcast will be your questions, comments, and suggestions. And I'm going to go dive into the mailbag, look at YouTube comments, maybe look at some of the comments from um, our blog posts on our website, and from members on the website, and uh, maybe even touch on a few emails, but hear from you. So the rest of it will be you, and then my reactions to those, or my feedback, or answers, or whatever you want to view that as being. So... Um, as for me, I've been busy last couple of weeks, been taking on the caregiver role, which is interesting because so many of us, we, um, what's the term I'm looking for? So many of us owe a lot to our caregivers who took care of us or are still taking care of us, uh, during benzodiazepine withdrawal or bind or whatever else we're going through. And, um, Sometimes it's nice to switch that around to where you're the caregiver and you get to give back a little bit. My wife had surgery a couple weeks ago, and I've been taking care of her for the last two, two and a half weeks, just kind of, it's a slow recovery, um, but she's doing great. Um, that's all I'll say about it, but she's doing great. Everything's fine, but it's just a slow recovery. So, um, and of course we got a new dog <laughs> just before we did this a week or two. And so, um, new puppy, wife going through that. So, a lot of my time has just been dedicated to taking care of the house, taking care of my wife, taking care of the dog. And that's taken up most of my time. So I've been busy doing that. That's life. And I've been grateful for it. I am very grateful that I've had that opportunity to take care of someone else. That's, I think sometimes we complain about that maybe a little too much when actually we need to realize that that's a gift. It's a gift to be needed. It's a gift to be wanted. It's a gift to be able to be there for someone. Yes, it can get to an extreme. And for some of us, it can, um, especially those of you who have been caregivers for benzodiazepine patients, it can be get to be way too much. But it's also, it's also nice to be able to turn the tables and allow me to be a caregiver and take care of somebody. And I'm grateful for that opportunity. Oh, you know, something came across the news um, oh, before I do that, I do want to mention our puppy. Um, <laughs> I, I slid that in there. I said a new puppy, and I didn't it didn't um, add anything to that. I did post a blog on our website uh, last week on this. So if you would like to learn more, please feel free to check out that at easinganxiety.com. Go to our blog post, and you'll see the picture of Murphy. Murphy is a six-month-old Great Pyrenees Border Collie Mix we adopted from a shelter, from a foster home down in Denver. And we got him about three, three weeks ago, three and a half weeks ago. And he's been amazing. He's great. A lot of work, but he's amazing. And um, we're getting some training for him. We've been taking care of him, lots of walks, playing with him. He's just a delight. In fact, he's over here on the floor 
doesn't even really know that I'm talking about him. So, shh, you know, because he's not looking up, but <laughs> he's over here on the floor next to me, crashed out. And um, it's a delight to have that back again. Uh, for those of you, um, and I won't go into a lot of detail right now, but for those of you who have been with us for a while on this podcast, you know that Bear, our Aussie Shepherd mix, who passed away about two years ago, two years ago, August, um, was my constant companion throughout my um, the worst months and the worst years of bind and benzo withdrawal. So it was nice that we finally are ready to move on and get a new dog, and it's great that we got such a great dog, and we're just really excited to add that to our life. And um, he's also been a huge social benefit. And this is one of the things that I don't know that we always credit to dogs and cats too. I think more dogs because they're outside more and they can attract people to you. But since we've had the dog and we've been back walking with the dog, we stop and talk to two to three times the number of people on our walks that we did when it was just the two of us. And I think the dogs, of course, attract people to you. Other people with dogs are attracted to you to say hi and they sniff. And we've set up three or four play dates with our dog just recently. In fact, just last night, met another young couple that are, have moved in not too far from us and they have a small um, black lab. And we've been setting up these play dates with them and we get to meet the people. They come over, we have a drink or something and the dogs go out and play in the backyard. And it's, it's a great icebreaker. Um, for those of us who have become isolated and become, for, for whatever reasons, whether it's withdrawal and bind or it's something else, whatever it is that's causing that isolation in our lives, it's a benefit. It's a benefit to have the dog help us socialize, which I'm not as good at as, as I used to be, I'll admit. I'm not as good at socializing. I think my self-esteem and confidence, and we've talked about this, have taken a hit through my Benzo experience. So it's nice to... It's nice to have that back and be more social. And we're, we're putting an effort into trying to be more social with people around us and stuff like that. So anyway, it's a benefit and something to keep in mind that pets and dogs and, and cats too and any kind of animal can not only be a benefit because you have somebody to take care of, um, give you meaning, give you purpose, um, but also give you company, of course, at home. But they also help you reach out to others. And I think that's been a great thing. So. I'm going to move on here real quick. Anyway, that's our new mascot. His name is Murphy. I'll be, I'm sure, talking more about him on this podcast and um, other podcasts as we're doing. In fact, I'm going to move on to that really quickly. I've uh, been, been working with Doreen Shervin, who's um, my new um, cohort here, and she's been help providing a lot. She's been writing some blog posts. And for those, I think I talked about her in the last podcast. And of course, if you've been on the blog, you will see some of the stuff by her um, that's out there. But she's been great. And um, in fact, she's written a blog post on 988, the National Suicide Crisis Line, on the new federal anxiety screening recommendations, a couple articles on coping, one coping day to day with bind and one she just published today, which is coping when having a bad day. Um, she's sharing her personal stories and her personal experiences is what I asked her to do. And it's great. And um, I'm really enjoying having another writer here and another contributor to what we're doing. And we'll be adding some more people too. So this is just the beginning of branching out on this and branching out on the podcast and branching out on the other work we do. Uh, if you also haven't been to our website lately, you'll know that I've already published um, some, I published some blog posts recently too. I've been doing the series on what we learned from the Benzo survey. I posted two of those already just this last month. I also posted a, a blog post on happy fifth anniversary to easing anxiety. Yes, it was August 20th was our fifth anniversary of launching the launching Benzo free website. And it's when I published my book and that's when all this started. And then we went to the Benzo free website, then it became the easing anxiety website, but that's how all that started. So that was five years ago. Um, and I also wrote a blog post to introduce my dog Murphy to everybody. So these are some of the things on the website. If you are only listening to the podcast, you're not getting those. Um, best thing to do there is just go to our website at easinganxiety.com slash subscribe, subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to join to our site, more content's coming there too. And it's a good place to find out what's happening. Another thing, two more things I want to talk about. One is we just hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. 
people go crazy. Um, <laughs> and I'll put the caveat out here. I know that this may not seem a lot to a lot of people. There's plenty of other Benzo channels out there who have 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 and more subscribers. And that's all great. I don't really care. I'm not so focused on the number. Um, but there's one change that does happen. I will admit by hitting 1,000 subscribers, um, we can now monetize, which means, yes, <laughs> you will start seeing some ads from YouTube on our podcast and on our videos, which we've got some of those coming out. And anything else we do on YouTube, you'll start to see some ads. Um, I launched this a few days ago and, you know, it's, the money is nominal. It's not much coming in right now, but it will be a little bit. We just have to find ways to monetize what we do. That's what we're doing on the on the site too. And to help make it so we can sustain this and keep going. That's really the purpose. And so I'm not going to apologize for the for the advertisements. Um, it's something we need to have. See how I'm working on that? I'm trying not to say sorry for those who have listened to my previous podcast. You know, that was an issue for me. Um, and so what? I'm going to say sorry sometimes. But this is just how it is. We need to start ha to bring some revenue in from the work we've done. And this is one way to do it. And so you might see some of those um, coming through and that's what's going on. So I wanted to let you know. So anyway, we had a thousand subscribers. Thank you to all those people who subscribed. That is great. As we start doing live events, which are coming really soon. Um, we also have super chat on there, which people can, you know, pay a few bucks to do a super chat and get, you know, more things on that kind of stuff. So that's all tied in. We're trying to monetize this a little bit to make it, to not only make it more sustainable, but also to grow it. So we have more writers, we have more content, we have more going on here. And we are doing that. If you've seen Doreen's recent posts, that's part of that growing. And I've been doing more blog posts. We will be adding some more podcast content. All that's growing as we go along. Now, um, last part of this introduction, hopefully, you know me, I go off on tangents, so I can't promise that to you. <laughs> but last part of this introduction is something I observed just recently, and I wanted to tie it back in to a couple of things. So there's, there's two quick stories I'm going to tell you, and then I'll, I'll tie them together. One is, I was a big Monty Python fan growing up, and that was just the funniest thing ever I saw. For those who are Monty Python fans or know anything about Monty Python, Flying Circus, Monty Python movies, all the different members and everything, um, I thought it was hilarious. And I still think it's hilarious. And I still love their comedy. And I think their comedy lasts. That's my personal opinion. Um, some people may disagree, but I think they're great. Anyway, um, in college, I was a member of the university program board at my college, which means we help program the entertainment coming into to the campus. My responsibility was film. So I was bringing all the film and that's how I, you know, I had this always this interest in film, then be later became a film writer and my degree was in film production. So I did all that for a while, but I programmed the films that came in, but other members would do lectures and entertainment and music and all that kind of stuff. So one of the lectures we brought in was Graham Chapman and he is one of the six members of Monty Python was, he has passed away um, many years ago, but he was, um, he was one of the ones we brought in. And what was great about this program board in college is I got to meet some pretty amazing people. And we were able, I was able to go out to dinner with me and some other members of our, of our programming board, along with Graham Chapman and his partner. Um, and we just had a delightful time. Actually, I talked more to his partner at the time than I did to Graham because Graham was kind of shy um, and didn't talk too much. But when he got on stage, he was downright hilarious. He was just hilarious. He talked about this thing. I think it was called the most dangerous sports club or something like that, that he and his friends and other Monty Python people and other people were doing. And he showed these videos of it and it was just downright hilarious. So anyway, he and, and, and all the other members of Python and everything were just um, a key for me growing up because laughter was so important. My dad had a great sense of humor. I married a woman who has a great sense of humor. Her dad has a great sense of humor. That's, we both had these dads that just were hilarious. Um, and a lot of people in our lives, my aunt has a great sense of humor. I mean, just all these people that really fed that to it. And I just want to say how important that is. So that's that story. I got to meet Grant Chapman. Um, he died not that long after I had a chance to meet him. So I was very grateful that I got a chance to talk to that gentleman and, and meet him. I didn't, never got to know him, didn't talk to him too long, but it was nice. 
another person who I never met, but who just passed away. I want to mention this one. And, and trust me, I'm going to wind this up. <laughs> I'm going to find a way to do that. But for those of you who may not know, um, Jimmy Buffett passed away just a few days ago um, with a, a rare form of skin cancer. I think it was Merkel cell skin cancer is what he had, if I remember correctly. For those who don't know Jimmy Buffett, um, he is a, a musician, amazing musician. He's been playing for years, has a huge following, and um, and also wrote books. He's done a musical. He's <laughs> He ha owns a series of hotels and casinos and restaurants, and he's a, he's a billion-dollar businessman. He turned his songs and everything into this huge um this huge world of parrot heads. And I was a parrot head. Actually, I guess I still am. But for 10 or 15 years, I was following around and went to several of his concerts and I just loved it. I loved the music and I loved what the music stood for. And this brings me back to the two stories. And that's why few people, few celebrities when they pass hit me emotionally. Robin Williams was one of those ones who when he died, um, I was working in downtown Boulder, and Boulder is where the setting of Mork and Mindy was. I remember walking outside, and there was the Boulder Theater. And this is literally two blocks from the house that was supposedly where Mork and Mindy was, was set. And, of course, they shot it in L.A., but this was the house. Um, I would walk by it on my daily walks from work. But I stepped outside of the work, and I looked up at the marquee of the Boulder Theater. And all it said was Nano Nano which is, of course, Mork's famous phrase from Mork and Mindy. I literally broke down and cried right there. It just really hit me. And, of course, the way he died and the humor he brought to people's lives and the joy he brought to li his people's lives to lose him so early was hard. Jimmy Buffett died in his 70s. He still had a long way to go. And I also feel like we lost him early. And, and Graham Chapman is another one of those. He died very young, and we lost him. We, we lost these, these people too, way too early. But what I'm tying all this together and why I'm rambling on about this is that is the lightness they brought to our lives. And that is needed more, in my opinion, right now than we've ever needed it. It seems like we're angry all the time. It seems like we're divided all the time. It seems like we are looking for reasons to hate each other, which is just ridiculous. I don't understand this. But these are the people who were saying, no, life doesn't have to be that serious all the time. It, it, there's, there's a lightness that we need to make sure we keep in our lives. The humor of a Graham Chapman and the humor of a Robin Williams is, is essential to how we, how we get by and how we survive in this crazy world around us. And the music and the, the ideology of a Jimmy Buffett about having a margarita sitting on a beach with a big hat on and, and a lay around the neck and, and people in swimsuits and just, you know, that's an idea and it's a lifestyle and it's a way of lightening life, of not taking it too seriously. And so when I heard the news of Jimmy Buffett, it just made me think of, of this topic, which is celebrate those individuals and individuals work who helps you lighten the effects of life especially for those of us going through bind and benzo withdrawal and chronic health problems whatever they may be we need ways of lightening the load i know i do and I look for those things, and I, I, I look for comedies. I look for lightness. I look for good music, anything that helps lighten the load and to help us get through life. So that's, I don't know, that hit me. I don't know if it was beneficial, beneficial to you or not. I just wanted to touch on this, that and, um, and mention it to you because I thought it was somewhat poignant. So anyway, there you go. Rest in peace, Jimmy. Rest in peace. And so that brings us to our format today, which is our intro, which you just heard, and then our mailbag. And we are going to have a moment of peace. So I'm going to throw that back in there. I haven't done one for a couple weeks, so we'll close out. So we're going to have the intro, mailbag, moment of peace. So the rest of the time here is filled up 
with the mailbag. Your questions, your comments, your stories, your your answers, whatever you got out there. I'm just going to, I have not prepped any of these this time. Sometimes I put them into the script. Sometimes I even partially script my answers, although most of the time I don't. I just sometimes even highlight pieces of their story that I want to talk on. Um, but this time, I'm not even doing that. I'm going to just dive in and I might pause the recorder as I look for ones, but I'm just going to go find comments uh, from you all and we're going to talk about it. But before we do that, you can, don't forget to check us out on our different channels. You can find us on YouTube and Twitter at Easing ANX and on Facebook at Easing ANX FB. Or even better, visit our website. That's where you can subscribe to our email newsletter and where you can get all our content, including our blog posts, which you don't get through this um, through this channel. And you can search for any subject you want to. We have 320, 330, whatever now posts on there, and we're growing those rapidly. So, And all those are searchable by keywords, so you can look for something specific you're looking for. Just come on over and check it out. And you can also comment. If you sign up to our site, right now it's totally free to sign up on our site. If you do that, you can comment on our on our blog posts, on our podcast episodes, videos, information pages, resources, stories, whatever we have on there. You can comment on those. And we we want you to. We love that kind of feedback. And that's, that's the stuff I see uh, before anything else. Things you comment on the website is what I see first. And I try to reply to those first, okay? So even before the YouTube comments, which I welcome, I love those. Thanks for doing that. And emails and everything else are all great. But things that are done through the website, I just see first because that's where most of my attention is right now. And remember, the Benzo Free Podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Important to get that in there. So we're at 20 minutes about on the intro, which is a, a good long. Usually I try to keep them about 10 minutes. This one was 20, so... I know it was longer. I don't know if it was meaningful to you, but I'm okay with that. Um, if I don't keep trying things and just speaking from the cuff about who I am and what's going on, then I'm not being genuine. And the one thing I will always do on this podcast and another podcast that we're going to get launched side by side here very shortly, and all our content on our page is to be genuine. That's my goal, especially in a world of AI and a world of misinformation. And I'm not saying misinformation as a political thing because I believe it comes from all sides of the spectrum. This is not choosing sides anywhere, but there's a lot of stuff out there and not all of it's real. And so I want to make sure that I am always genuine and real with you. And if ever you question that or you doubt that, let me know and I'll be happy to try to convince you otherwise, okay? because that's what we're about. In fact, at the end of all our blog posts now, I have just started to add, um, what is the phrase I think I've added? Um, let me look here really quickly. See, this is one of those things I'm doing as I do it, so. Basically, it's in response to the ongoing um, concerns about artificial intelligence. And at the bottom of each one, I say, this article was written by a living, breathing human. And Doreen is adding that to hers, too. So. One thing on our site that I will promise you right now is that while, yes, we have used AI for research, because honestly, if you do a Google search in some way, shape, or form, you're using AI. So when you're doing research, it's really hard not to wind up using AI to find things. But none of our writing is done by AI, not initially and not you know throughout the entire process. We write our blog posts. I write all the scripts when I have those for the podcast, and this is me talking. So AI is not generating our content. We are living, breathing human beings, and we will stay that way. And our goal is to be genuine. Um, Doreen just released some information about her and how she copes with bad days, sharing her, her herself with everybody, and I do the same thing. And this is what we are about. This is what I think works. And this is what I promise that we will continue to do here at Easing Anxiety so, and at the Benzo Free Podcast. So let's move on to our mailbag. I'm going to pause it here for a second. You won't notice it, but I'm going to pause it here for a second while I look for the first thing to talk about. Thanks. The first one is a comment to an article I wrote on indecision. It was titled, Anxiety and Indecision, Six Tips to Help You Decide. And the first 
tip that I listed was don't overthink the outcomes. Don't overthink the outcomes. Meaning we can't predict the future. Therefore, and this was according to a Psychology Today article, um, they had a quote that said, making decisions is usually a crapshoot, <laughs> which is, which honestly is more real and true than most of us want to admit. It's useful to have confidence in the decisions you make, but it's also important to be aware that you have no control over the outcome of them. In fact, many outcomes have no relation to the decisions you made at all. Well, Graham, one of our um, one of my dearest friends from way back in the podcast, wrote in, and Graham's great at giving us feedback. In fact, he's part of our advisory team we're putting together to help us with future um, progress here at the site. But Graham wrote the following: D. Great read and very useful pointers for us all. I particularly like the decision outcome paradox, where you can make the right decision, yet get the wrong outcome and vice versa. How many of us go through the best decision-making process, but because the outcome is not as good as we wanted, decided that we followed the wrong process? And I think we all, we all do this at times. And Graham, thanks for the comment. I love that one. We, we, we believe we have more control over life than we do. This is common amongst human beings is we believe we have more control over the things that happen to us than we, than we really do. And that can have a negative effect, has a negative effect in different ways, but really can have a negative effect on how we view the outcomes of our decisions afterwards. We can place too much importance on hey, we made the wrong decision, when actually maybe we made the right decision. It's just the outcome was different than we wanted because the outcome was going to be different anyway. Maybe we could have made the decision five different ways and the outcome was still going to be the same. We don't know that. Unless we can go back and relive that event over and over again. We don't know that. So it's so easy to have that be one of those moments that we then keep in our psyche and say, Oh, but I can't make a decision because see what happened here when maybe that result had nothing to do with that decision. And there are so many other factors, and I talk about them in this article, that help us freeze up when we are trying to make a decision. I used to be a pretty decisive person most of the time in my life, but I'll admit, little loss of self-esteem, bind, all that stuff that goes along with it. I wasn't as confident, and I'm still not quite as confident as I used to be. And I share that with you. Um, you've heard me share my lack of confidence with you many times on this podcast, and I'm okay doing that. Maybe I have, a, maybe I have confidence because I have the confidence to share my lack of confidence. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know. Probably not. But I think you see where I'm going. And I want to thank Graham for um, his insight and providing. Graham's been great at replying. Um, in fact, I'm reading these off of our blog post on our website. So um, please feel free to comment there too on those types of things. And I love to get your feedback. I'm going to go with a couple more here off our blog posts on our website. And then I'll probably move over to YouTube and see what's going on there. So let's find our next one. On a blog post that I wrote a little while ago, what was it? It was... July 24th, and it was called Benzo's Bind in the Five Stages of Grief. So I mentioned about the, the five stages of grief in here, which according to um, Kubler-Ross's book, they are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And how I've seen us move through those, and many individuals move through those, especially when it relates to bind and benzo withdrawal. Here are a few of the comments on that article. And the first one I want to mention is the first one that came through. And this was from Sounds of Silence, and the, and the comment was as such. The five stages of grief are a simplistic model and have been disputed since 2021. So anyway, in response to that response from Sound of Silence, I just wanted to say I agree. I think almost anything that's put, put out there, any type of psychological principles, any type of you know treatments, whatever it is, has probably been debunked by now. This was 50 years ago. Only because there are so many factors, so many different um, subjective elements that come into play that these aren't going to work for everyone. That's one thing at Easing Anxiety and Benzo Free Podcast that I want to make sure we are always steadfast on, which is there is no one path. 
There's no one path through bind. There's no one path through the benzo withdrawal. I know some coaches and other people out there may believe and may say, hey, here's the one path. And, and for those that that works for, that's amazing. But I know that also hasn't worked for some others. We're not going to tell you there's one way to get through this. We want to work with you where you are, where you're at, and help you find a path to get through. That's what we're here for. For me, I have seen this. I haven't seen it in everybody. But I've seen it consistently enough to see that pattern in many individuals. And no offense, but I've done the research and it is still highly regarded research in most of the literature that I find. So I may disagree uh, with Sound of Silence, but it doesn't mean that this person's wrong or I'm wrong. It means we have a difference of opinion and that's okay. That's okay to have. But some other comments were extremely helpful too. Abbott 2002 wrote, I love this. I was first introduced to Kubler-Ross's work in a psychology class a long time ago and found it incredibly helpful. So some good feedback on that one. And I love seeing the feedback on these articles on our website. This is a great place to go to if you want to respond. Again, these are the ones that I see first. So if you're trying to get my attention on a response, um, for the podcast or for um, any blog, go right to our website and comment on that. All you have to do is log in um, or just, you know, it doesn't take much and it's free to log in, but that way you have access to be able to comment to these articles. And that is helpful to us. So let's move on now to YouTube. Yes, we're going to go to YouTube and I'm going to tackle some comments from there. This comment is from Greg Rhodes, 9139, to our podcast titled, who am I now? Confidence and self-esteem and benzo withdrawal. Greg wrote, hearing the compassion in your voice is so healing. I feel connected with you. That means a lot. Thanks again for what you do. It's been a while since I've listened to you. Wow, Greg, thanks. And Greg wrote some several other comments on some recent ones too. And Greg's actually been writing into our podcast for some time now. And I just want to say how much, how grateful I am for those comments. Thank you so much for writing in and, and letting us know how you feel. But this is why I mentioned connection is so important. I get feedback like this all the time. I feel connected. Thank you for that connection. Thanks for being, thanks for being that person, that voice I hear. I fall asleep to your voice, which, you know, I don't know how to take, but actually I take it as a very positive thing because if I'm helping people, especially those of us who may struggle with insomnia and everything else, like I can help you go to sleep. Great. I love it. I love it. Whatever it is, I don't care. I just happy that by me talking in front of this mic in my basement in Colorado is somehow helping you get through perhaps one of the most trying times of your life, then my life is right where it's supposed to be. So that's how I feel from that. So Greg, again, always good to hear from you and thanks for the comment. Okay, let's move on to another one. This one is related to a podcast I did on Benzo Belly, Our Gut and Withdrawal, Take Two. Um, of course, I did another episode, Our Benzo Belly, Our Gut and Withdrawal, early in the very early part of the podcast, which is still our most listened to episode of the podcast. So thanks to all those people who checked that one out. But this was the second one I did because it had been so um, popular. The first one I did another episode again. Anyway, this one is at Enjoy It Music Matt is the person who wrote it. And Matt wrote, I have it now. Oh my God, it's so infuriating. I'm sure re reporting that, referring to Benzo Belly. Anyway, I have it now. Oh my God, it's so infuriating. I'm working out and eating healthier than ever. And I bloat like I gained 30 pounds. Face swells too sometimes. These symptoms are strange. I know it's not permanent. I was on 30 milligrams Valium daily for three years. And I've only been off for two months. Well, thanks um, for the comment. And again, wow, so sorry for what you've been through. I, I totally can relate to the benzo belly. That's one that I had significantly early on. I even had some recent bouts with it again after long COVID. As we know, long COVID and benzo um, and bind do seem to aggravate each other. So I think we've talked about that a few times. But this is important to know. Benzo belly is one of the most common um, symptoms and it's so prevalent. And so we want to mention, make sure we mention and talk about it when we can. But some of the things that go along with it include abdominal distension, which is a very extreme. It, it can make anybody look like they're six, seven months pregnant 
It can have that much. I've had that kind of bloating before and had it off and on throughout my whole experience. One of the things I found, though, is that I know this sounds, I'm not, first of all, not a nutritionist. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not anything. So none of this is medical advice and none of this is nutrition advice. I'm referring to you what I've seen and what I've dealt with. That being said, when we say healthy diet, first of all, that can vary depending on who you speak to about what a healthy diet is. It does vary based on different information and different research and different experts. The only thing I've ever mentioned about benzo belly and diet is trial and error. You have to kind of figure out what works for you. That's what I've seen. That's what we've learned. Each person is different. Um, I know there are some coaches out there and some people who work with a straight vegetarian diet and say this is the only way to do it. And for those that works for, that's great. This person and I disagree on the fact that that works for everyone. I just have seen it have the opposite effect with some people. I come from the aspect of, I come from the philosophy of Find what works for the individual and that we are all different. And diets are different for different people. I truly believe that. And that's what I've seen and that's what I stand by. So when you say healthy, the question is, what does healthy mean? Like if I am eating a healthy diet, that means a lot of fruits and vegetables. That's what I think the world's trying to tell me. Okay. Lots of fruits and vegetables, less meat and sugar. Um, and some of that's true. And so if I eat more fruit though, my problem is I have... Um, a FODMAP kind of condition, which is um, these saccharides that set off my stomach problems, my stomach distress sometimes. This is pre-benzos. I'm still figuring out some of this. But so fruits actually set me off. The sugars and fruits really set me off. So that makes me worse. I'm eating what I'm supposed to be doing healthier, and some vegetables do that too. I actually do better on more of a meat and protein-based diet. At least when I went through this, for a while, I was eating only chicken and white rice. That was it. That's what I could, only thing I could eat for a few weeks there. I couldn't eat anything else without my stomach going nuts. Now I can eat much more of a varied diet. It's come back. And I try to eat more balanced diet. And I still try to eat some vegetables and fruits, but I'll guarantee you right now, fruit still set me off. I can do some berries, but it's one of those things where each person is different. Find what works for you. And I know that takes time. I know it's frustrating, but the best thing to do is eliminate or add food one at a time and see how you react and see what works for you. Find a few foods you can rely on that you know aren't going to upset you. And then maybe try other ones and add to it. Again, not a nutritionist, dietitian, or anything. So this is just my comments. Um, so not coming from a professional. I'm just saying, though, this is what I've seen is people try to work with what works for you. And find, try to find what fits you. Don't just believe any diet when you read it or anybody telling you this is absolutely the way you have to go. Because I have seen that we're all different. And we have different reactions to different foods. So find what works for you. That would be my two cents. Anyway, moving on. This comment was from at Faffy58. Related to a podcast I did recently titled Lazy Morning on the Patio Updates Community Compassion and Coaching. The comment was, way too much about you. <laughs> probably true. Um, I do that a lot here. As you saw in the introduction, that was probably a lot about me um, in the 20-minute introduction. And I am learning to be less apologetic about that. <laughs> this is me. This is what I do. I talk about things that I find interesting. I talk about things that I think are related to what we work with. And I always try to tie it back to helping us get through the day. But yes, I do talk about me quite often. I want to give a shout out to my friends who came to my defense in the comments, especially Angie Peacock came up and said, that's not a very nice thing to say, eek. So thank you, Angie. Um, I appreciate that. But I also appreciate the feedback. Like I mentioned, it can be critical. And I'm okay with critical feedback because that helps me grow and it challenges me. But I wanted to mention Angie because... Um, that actually brings up a mind that I was watching a YouTube video on some coverage of Burning Man. For those of you who haven't seen the news on that lately, they had a massive rainstorm um, early Labor Day weekend and turned the whole Black Rock Desert into a mud pit. Um, 
70,000 plus people, I think, in RVs and everything. And we're told to shelter in place, preserve water, preserve food, preserve fuel, because they could not get out. The roads had flooded out. Um, you couldn't drive around because of the mud. It was crazy. Anyway, I was watching some coverage on that. All of a sudden, this interview came up and the face popped up. And guess who it was? It was Angie Peacock, my good friend Angie. And it was so good to see her and such a pleasure to see her and that she was doing okay. And I texted her really quick and she texted me back and said she was doing fine. I was just concerned about her and wanted to make sure she was okay. But um, I just checked out her Facebook page and um, she has mentioned that she was... Um, covered by many different news articles, BBC, Sky News, CNN, New York Times on stuff that she had done there and was providing some really good um, coverage of what was happening. And so, um, Angie, you hang in there. You go. <laughs> it's like, it's great. I mean, it's, uh, I saw you at Burning Man. I was going, of course she's at Burning Man. Way to go. It's like she's just she's living life, living out of her RV, traveling around the, the country, experiencing all kinds of things and helping out people with anxiety, with benzo withdrawal, veterans, whoever it is, and helping people along the way. So huge shout out to Angie Peacock. She's one of the good ones. Um, there's so many good ones in this in this community. I'm not saying she's the only one, but she's, she's one of them. If you want to learn more about her, go out to apeacockconsulting.com and you can learn about, learn more about Angie. Um, she's, she's a sweetheart. I love her to death and hopefully she'll be driving through Denver again soon and parking her RV out front and hanging out with us for a few days again. We look forward to having her. Anyway, a lot more comments came on that video and it was really wonderful because, um, after Angie kind of came to my defense, Julie Adams, longtime friend, wonderful, wrote in and said, great podcast as usual. Great info. She loved the podcast. And um, at Faffy wrote back and actually clarified some things, very friendly comment. And then Angie wrote back in and other people wrote in and it became this wonderful thing. It was, it was really great, this great conversation back and forth. And sometimes we disagree with each other. Sometimes we're a little critical and that's okay. And this is what was wonderful about this post that people would come out and talk about things and talk back and forth and be supportive of each other. So Thanks to everybody for the feedback on that post. I really appreciated it. This was on the post, um, actually the video that we put out, which was the bind roundtable. That was for the release of the survey that we did, the, the recent paper we did, the third paper on the Benzo survey that was on bind. And we did a roundtable with the researchers on that. In fact, Angie Peacock, we just talked about her, was actually the host. She was visiting us at that time. So she was the MC for that video and we had all the had most of the researchers there with us on that recording so if you haven't if you had a chance and want to check that out please go do so but this is from at i design cute things 2196 and this person wrote i know it is of utmost importance to get medical studies and papers published that definitely needs to continue to happen thank you for all of your hard work but i think we need to keep using the internet to spread awareness it's the most powerful tool and it goes on and on for a little bit. And then it kind of closes with this section. This is a long post, but this person closes with, got to focus and push full steam ahead and just swiftly push the opposing voice aside and ignore them. Keep our eyes on the target. Major, mega, widespread awareness on how to safely taper and better yet, never take these drugs to begin with. The internet is the key. The power is right here in our hands. Have the mindset that the internet was slow, solely created to help us spread the word to prevent more unnecessary suffering from injuries from these medications. So this is a very interesting post, and I like where you're coming from. Um, and I think we've thought about some of this, and I think you have a good point, but I also think there's also some limitations that we can do. Number one, the research is important. Um, I'm still involved in the uh, same research team that I'm on now. We're now working on a survey and working on a syst uh, systematic review or systemic, whoa, I can't say, anyway, a review, <laughs> I can't talk today, as you could tell, a review of literature on benzodiazepines. So I'm involved in two projects going on right now along with some others. So we're still doing work along with some other studies. Um, but those are important because here's the thing about it is doctors, although not all doctors read studies and really listen to them, but this is more what they respond to, okay? Science. Um, most medical professionals are trained to respond to science and the science they're trained to listen to is not just blasting out on the internet 
most doctors that I know and I've talked to ignore that stuff. What they're paying attention to are the studies and legitimate studies published in legitimate high profile journals. That's the stuff they're going to pay attention to. Now, that's not going to always get out to all the people, but that's that's the that's the information that doctors pay attention to. That's why research is so important. Getting the research out there and then getting it picked up by media and the internet is a really good combination. And we did that with this last paper. We worked with Psychology Today. We got into all different kinds of um, venues and we just got up published in Washington Post just this last week again, referring to that article. It keeps popping up in national articles. So that research is what's generating this publicity. And that's why we focus so much on Ford. So yes, the research is important, but you are correct. The media around the research is also important. But just blasting information out there doesn't work. There's a couple things. One is money. It takes money to put things on the internet and it takes money to get them recognized, to produce content. It takes a lot of money that most of us don't have. Um, also, it takes the algorithms and you have to play into the content to get something recognized. You can't just suddenly put it out like a cat video and say suddenly everybody's tuning into this Benzo video. It doesn't usually work that way. Now, you mentioned that you know sometimes it takes a few more things for this to break free. And yes, sometimes, unfortunately, a tragedy with a celebrity or something like that that's linked to benzodiazepines can get more attention. These are the things that do happen sometimes. I'm not wanting that. I'm just saying that is sometimes how we get more attention. But if you think we're not putting media out there on the internet, that's where I'm going to disagree with you. I put out, I publish the blogs as much as I can. I publish our podcast as much as I can. I know BIC and the Alliance and many of the channels out there are publishing content all the time and trying to get it out there. There's many people with, vid, with YouTube channels that have far more subscribers than I do, that keep putting out content. We're putting out the content. The problem is, is that there are trillions of minutes of hours of content on the internet that we're competing with. So it may seem like we can suddenly get all this coverage, but there are so many th other things that are vying for the eyeballs of the public and who those people are, pay who they're paying attention to. So. Yeah, we keep fighting and we're going to keep using the internet to try to raise awareness. But unfortunately, it's not a simple puzzle to um, solve. And if you want to help and do your own channel or start publishing things or you can help with that area, please go out there and help raise awareness. We need the support. But there honestly are a handful of people who are doing most of the work in the awareness. And we're working as hard as we can. We really are. And we're trying to get the message out there as much as we can. So thanks for the comment. Great comment. I appreciate it. This next one is from an, uh, a video podcast episode back when I was actually shooting my podcast episodes on video titled Benzo Brain Cognitive Symptoms and Withdrawal. And at, Le wow, at Lena Silf 2239, I hope I got that close mentions, has your memory further improved since this episode? So that episode came out probably a few years ago, um, a while back. And yes, absolutely it has. I want to make sure I kind of sneak this in here and let people know. It's always that fine line. I've talked about this before in the podcast of sharing with you difficulties I still have going on without triggering anybody or, or not triggering. I don't like to keep using that word, but without setting people off about, hey, what you're, what's happening with you is going to be me because that's not the case. We've talked about this many times. Please don't use me as an example. I made some mistakes. I've had other comorbidities that are going on that are causing more problems. So please don't use me as a symptom. I, I mean, as a, as a, um, as a model of what, where you're going to be. I'm having a little trouble thinking there. <laughs> There's the brain question. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Suddenly my brain is all over the map. Has my memory improved? Yes, my memory has improved and my cognitive function has improved from earlier on in the benzo withdrawal. I can say that for true. Um, but I still have problems. But I also had some problems before the benzos. So how much of that is related to bind? I can't say specifically. I've never had a great memory. Um, I have ADHD, which often people with ADHD don't have great short-term memory. Um, it's very common with us. And before, I can tell you, honestly, before I ever took a benzo, I already did have a great memory. So am I back to that starting point? 
I don't know that I am yet. Um, maybe I'm pretty close, but I still have, but I do still have memory and cognitive issues. Some of those I think are benzo related, but it's definitely better than it was. Um, the fact that I'm doing this, the fact that I can record a podcast and I can, you know, build up this site and build a network and community and co-chair, um, a national work group and, and, you know, be on research teams. I don't think I could do all that if I didn't have a functioning brain. So follow what you see me doing. <laughs> How's that for you? Check out my bio and look at the things I'm working in right now simultaneously and if you read that and you think I don't have some decent cognitive function now, then, you know, I don't know what to say. <laughs> but I am I think right now I sometimes do get down on myself because my brain's not working 100%. But part of that probably is due to just too much going on. I just have a lot of things happening right now. And between all the different work groups and research teams and organizations and the podcast and the website and teaming up with new people and, and um, you know, my home, the home front, a new dog, and yeah, <laughs> you know, maybe, just maybe, most of my memory problems right now is just plain life. And that is a possibility. I have to admit that. So, well, I'm going to wrap that there. Um, so many more comments. Maybe in the next one, I'll do another one maybe shortly on pretty soon on comments and questions. Like I mentioned before on my podcast a couple of ones back, I, have not been able to get to respond via email and other forms to everybody that's been sending in comments lately. And um, again, I very much appreciate all the comments and questions, and I do see all of them. I just don't always have a chance to respond to all of them, but I just want to let you all know how grateful I am for those ones that are coming in. Um, it's, it's a big help. It, it's what makes us, it's what makes this site successful. And I am very grateful for that. So thank you all for all you do. And we will tackle more of these coming soon, I promise. But I did promise you a moment of peace. And so before we do that, I do want to pause really quickly for our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical health or psychological advice nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. Please remember that you should only do this if you are in a safe place where you can close your eyes, relax, and let the world pass by without you for a minute. Today's meditation is a progressive relaxation meditation, or PMR. This is one of the simplest and easiest to learn techniques. There are many more advanced types of this, but we're going to stick with the basics today. We start by breathing in. As you do so, tighten a specific muscle group, say your hands, clenching them into fists. As you breathe out, relax the same muscles, your hands in this example, allowing all the tension to dissolve, and then move to a different muscle group. Examples of muscle groups to tense and relax would be your fists, biceps, forehead, jaw, neck, shoulders, lower back, buttocks, thighs, calves, and any other ones you can think of. A common form of this relaxation technique is to start at the tip of your head and work down, or at your toes and work up. We may not be able to cover the whole body today, but perhaps this is something you can try at a later time on your own. One word of caution though, do not over tense your muscles. Mild tension works just fine for this exercise. Also, 
If you have a history of serious injuries, muscle spasms, or back problems, please check with your physician before attempting this practice. And as always, if your mind wanders, no worries. Just gently bring it back to the activity of tensing and relaxing your muscles. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in while tensing a muscle group. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly relaxing those same muscles. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in, tensing another muscle group. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly, releasing all that tension. One more time. Take a deep breath in, tensing another muscle group. Hold it for a second and let it out slowly, relaxing all the tightened muscles along with your entire body. Now continue this with different muscle groups throughout your body. Inhale and tightening, exhale and relaxing. Continue to do this for one minute. Our next scheduled episode is episode 127 and it will be released next month. Thank you again for joining me today and please let us know how we did. Keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.